Hello there, folks. This is Jeff Murren, and wanting to continue our discussion of the Odyssey, specifically the Robert Fagel's translation of the book, and in this video, I want us to look specifically at book 13, which is titled Ithaca at Last. So our hero has co comes home in this particular uh, book, um, and it's about time. It's been 20 years, all right, in the making, and he's finally here. Now let's take a look at the first line. The first line says, his tale was now over. So if you remember, what he's been doing is he's been telling uh, King Alcinous, his wife Arete, Nausicaa, the people around, he's been telling everybody where he comes from, how he ended up on their shores, all right? Because we began in media race. We began in the middle of the story when he was on Calypso's island, all right? So then he ends up from going from Calypso's island to the Phaeacians where they are and then tells them the story. And he goes all the way back to Troy and leaving Troy and all the mishaps that took place to get him where he is now. So we are completely caught up. At the end of the last chapter, we were completely caught up with uh, our story from the beginning that we missed out on. Okay, so it's really a story within a story. It's Odysseus telling us his story within the story of the Odyssey. All right, um, and so, Let's jump right in. Let's take a look at this and let's begin. I want us to just to look at that, that first line. His tale is over now. Okay. Or his tale was over now. That's it. He's been telling them his story. Now, some people may say, all right, is it accurate? This story of his, how much of is it, how much of it is embellished this story of his, um, I don't know that we need to concern ourselves with that. It's the story that we have. All right, and it's the story that he has allowed us to have, um, Odysseus, or at least Homer developing the story and using the voice of Odysseus to uh, provide us with this, all right? Um, so we see at the, about, mm, let's say line five, I guess, King Alcinous says, nothing can hold you back however much you've suffered. You'll sail home, all right? Here, friends, here's a command for one and all. You who frequent my palace day and night and drink the shining wine of kings and enjoy the harper songs, the robes and hammered go gold and, hall and a hall of other gifts, you lords of our island council uh, brought our guest, all lie packed in his polished sea chest. Now come, each of us, add a sumptuous tripod, add a cauldron, then recover our cost with levies on the people. It's hard to afford such bounty man by man. So essentially, we... You know, everybody here, we've, you know, given all these gifts to Odysseus, add to them, pile on. Don't worry, you'll get back what uh, you have lost because we will levy other people and recoup your costs through it. It's kind of a, you know, uh, uh, sort of the government taxing the people to take care of the gifts that they're giving to Odysseus. But whatever, okay. It's not, uh, I didn't vote for King Alcinous, so don't. Uh, blame me. All right. And then Demonicus comes in again. Demonicus, remember the blind bard, who some people believe is Homer writing himself into the story. Uh, line 30, Demonicus, prized by all people, comes in. And then we have this nice ep epic simile on page 287, about line 35, let's say. It says, as a man aches for his evening meal, when all day long his brace of wine-dark oxen have dragged the bolted plowshare down a fallow field. How welcome the setting sun to him, the going home to supper. Yes, though his knees buckle, struggling home at last. So welcome now to Odysseus, the setting light of day. And he lost no time as he pressed facious men who loved their oars, addressing his host Alcinous first and foremost. Alcinous, majesty, shining among your island people, Make your libations. Launch me safely on my way to one and all. Farewell. Okay, so that's how thrilled he is that it's become night because he knows come morning they will deliver him home to Ithaca. And he says, uh, you know, may I find an unswerving wife when I reach home. All right. And it's interesting that he puts that out there, given what we know about the suitors and how they have been leeching his uh, 
his island dry of all its provisions and wanting to woo his wife and become, uh, you know, royalty there in their own right. Page 288, we turn the page there, line 51, it says, May the gods rain down all kinds of fortune on your lives. Misfortune never harbor in your homeland. Keep that in mind as we uh, get to the towards the end of this particular book. All right. He gives, he offers some uh, kind words and a, sort of like a cheers to Ariti. And so they head off. In their ship, page 289, we see a nice epic simile about line 93. It says, And the ship, like a four-horse team careening down the plain, all breaking as one with the whiplash cracking smartly, leaping with hooves high to run the course in no time, so the stern hove high and plunged with the seething rollers crashing dark in her wake, as on she surged, unwavering, never flagging, no, not even a darting hawk. The quickest things on wings could keep her pace. As on she ran, cutting the swells at top speed, bearing a man endowed with God's own wisdom, one who had suffered 20 years of torment, sick at heart, cleaving his way through wars of men and pounding waves at sea. But now he slept in peace, the memory of his struggles laid to rest. And then, here we go. That hour, the star rose up, the clearest night star that always heralds a newborn light of day. The deep sea going ship made landfall on the island. Ithaca at last. All right. So Odysseus slept so hard. He's been 20, it's been 20 years in the making. You got to give it to him. He slept so hard and the, and the sailing was so quick and smooth. He fell asleep and he landed, wasn't even, didn't even know that it had happened because he's asleep in the hull. All right. So I find this to be very interesting. I'm going to read a little bit here, beginning on page 290, a back and forth conversation between Poseidon and Zeus. All right. If you remember their brothers, Zeus is the god of the sky, Poseidon is the earth shaker, so all these elements down here he is in charge of, all right? Uh, the Phaeacians are his people. His people have just given safe passage to his own enemy, Odysseus, all right? So Poseidon hates Odysseus because of what Odysseus did to his son, Polyphemus, blinded the Cyclops, and he has been making it difficult for Odysseus to get home. And then what an insult it has to be to him for his own people, his very own people that he is, presides over, bloodline even it suggests in here, are the ones who give his enemy safe passage home. So let's take a look here. All right, it's that first break on page 290. Here at this bay, the Phaeacian crew put in. They'd known it long before. Driving the ship so hard, she ran up onto the beach, and for a good half her length, such a way the oarsman's brawny arms had made. Up from the beaches, swinging down to land, first they lifted Odysseus off the decks, linen and lustrous carpet too, and laid him down on the sand asleep. He's still asleep. They, they take him from the ship and put him down, and he's still asleep. Still dead to the world. Then hoisted out the treasure, proud Phaeacians, urged by open-hearted Pallas, lavished on him, setting out for home. They heaped them all by the olive trunk and the neat pile clear of the road for fear some passerby might spot and steal Odysseus's hoard before he could awaken. Then pushing off, they pulled for home themselves. But now Poseidon, god of the earthquake, never once forgetting the first threats he leveled at the hero, probed almighty Zeus to learn his plans in full. Zeus, father, I will loose I will lose my honor now among the mortals. Now here are the mortal men who showed me no respect. Phaeacians too, born of my own loins. I said myself that Odysseus would suffer long and hard before he made it home, but I never dreamed of blocking his return, not absolutely at least. Once you pledged your word and bowed your head, but now they've swept him across the sea in their swift ship. They've set him down in Ithaca. 
sound asleep, and loaded the man with boundless gifts, bronze, and hordes of gold and robes, aye, more plunder than he could ever have won from Troy if Odysseus had returned intact with his fair share. So actually, Odysseus is coming back after these 20 years a wealthier man because of the gifts that the Phaeacians gave him than he would with all the spoils that he got from Troy and he returned then. So he's, I don't want to necessarily say better off because he's going to have to, but I mean, he's given enough, it seems, maybe, I don't know the exact amounts, of course, but he's got a lot to replace because of everything the suitors have bled from Ithaca. But now he's got a pretty good nest egg that he's shown up with to maybe replace some of that. Anyway, incredible, Zeus who marshal, marshals the Thunderheads replied, Earthshaker, you with your massive power, why moaning so? The gods don't disrespect you. What a stir there'd be if they flung abuse at the oldest, noblest of them all. Those mortals? If any man so lost in his strength and prowess pays you no respect, just pay him back. The power is always yours. Do what you like, whatever warms your heart. King of the dark cloud, the earthquake god, agreed. I'd like to avenge myself at once as you advise, but I've always feared your wrath and shied away. Okay, so he's like, you know, I would do it, but, you know, I've always worried that I was going to upset you in the process. But now, now that I've gotten your permission, but now I'll crush that fine face and cut her out on the misty sea. Now on her homeward run from the latest convoy, they will learn at last to cease and desist from escorting every man alive. I'll pile a huge mountain around their port. And if you remember, this is exactly a um, prophecy that King Alcinous's father had given him, you know, because they had, they had promised to give safe passage to anybody. Like if you, if anybody needs a ride home, uh, you give them safe passage. And so they've lived up to that. And they did it with Odysseus here, and it's going to end up costing them. But remember what Odysseus said on, line, uh, on page 288, line 51, May the gods rain down all kinds of fortune on your lives. Misfortune never harbor in your homeland. Okay, so here we go. Wait, dear brother who collects the cloud, uh, who, who collects the clouds had second thoughts. Here's what seems best to me, all right? As the people all lean down from the city heights to watch her speeding home, strike her into a rock that looks like a racing vessel just offshore. Amaze all men with a marvel for the ages. Then pile your huge mountain around about their port. Hearing that from Zeus, the god of the earthquake sped to Scyra now, the Phaeacians' island home and waited there till the ship came sweeping in, scudding lightly along and surging close to breast. The earthquake god, with one flat stroke of his hand, struck her to stone, rooted her to the ocean floor, and made for open sea. The Phaeacians aghast. Those lords of the long oars, the master mariners, traded startled glances, sudden outcries. Look, who's pinning our swift ship to the sea? Just racing for home. Just hoof... Uh, into plain view. They might well wonder, blind to what had happened, till Alcinous rose and made things all too clear. Oh no, my father's prophecy years ago, it all comes to me with a vengeance now. He used to say Poseidon was vexed with us because we escorted all mankind and never came to grief. He said that one day, as a well-built ship of ours sailed home on the misty sea from such a convoy, the god would crush it. Yes, and pile a huge mountain around our port. All right, so it has come to pass. Down at the bottom, that last section there, great Odysseus woke from sleep on native ground at last. He'd been away for years, but failed to know the land, for the goddess Pallas Athena, Zeus's daughter, showered mist over all, so under cover she might change his appearance head to foot as she told him every peril he'd meet at home, keep him from being known by wife, townsman's friend, till the suitors pay the price for all their outrage. So the thing is, he wakes up on this island. The Phaeacians have gone. They're dealing with all the stuff that Poseidon is, is putting upon them, all right? And he wakes up, looks around. He's like, where the heck am I? All right, what? He doesn't recognize it because as Pallas Athena has done time and time again, she shrouded it in some kind of mist and made it unrecognizable because she's going to fill him in. She's going to change his appearance. And I want you to pay attention to the appearance that she gives him. 
all right? She's going to do something that is very reminiscent of something he did on his own whenever he infiltrated Troy and tried to get information, if you remember that. Um, it's spoken of how he went into Troy undetected, except Helen knew who he was. If that's a, that's a story, I believe she told to Telemachus when Telemachus went and, you know, uh, Helen got everybody drunk and they started talking about all kinds of things, all right? All right, so here we go. Um, a little clip here on page 293, just above, about three lines above line 230. says, Man of misery, whose land have I lit on now? What are they here? Violent, savage, lawless, or friendly to strangers? God-fearing men. Again, putting God-fearing and friendly to strangers in the same breath. That concept of xenia, taking care of, this, taking care of the stranger, is um, proving to the gods that you are doing their will. All right, so uh, Athena appears to him, but she does not appear to him as Athena, as just a lowly person on the island beginning on line 252. Uh, but now Athena appeared and came toward him. She looked like a young man, a shepherd boy, yet elegant too, with all the gifts that grace the sons of kings. With a well-cut cloak, falling in folds across her shoulders, sandals under her shining feet, a hunting spear in hand. Odysseus, overjoyed at the sight, went up to meet her, joining her now with salutations on the wing. Greetings, friend. Since you are the first I have come on in this harbor, treat me kindly. No cruelty, please. Save these treasures. Save me, too. I pray to you like a god. I fall before your knees and ask your mercy. And tell me this for a fact I need to know. Where on earth am I? What land? Who lives here? Is it one of the shiny, uh, sunny islands or some jutting shore of the good green mainland slanting down to sea? Athena, as the shepherd boy, answered, her eyes brightening now, you must be a fool stranger or come from nowhere if you really have to ask what land this is. Trust me. It's not so nameless after all. It's known the world around to all who live in the east and rising sun, and to all who face the western mists and darkness. Okay, so this Ithaca is known the world around, which gives us even more of an idea of just how important Odysseus is. He is the ruler of an island known the world around, according to this shepherd boy, a.k.a. Pallas Athena. It's a rugged land, too cramped for driving horses, but... Uh, though it's far from abroad, it's hardly poor. There's plenty of grain for bread, grapes for wine, the rain never fails, and the dew falls healthy. Good country for goats, good for cattle too. There's stand on stand of timber, and water runs in stream beds through the years. So, stranger, the name of Ithaca's reached uh, as far as Troy. And Troy, they say, is a long, hard sail from Greece. Ithaca? Heart racing Odysseus, that great exile, filled with joy to hear Athena, daughter of storming Zeus, pronounce that name. He stood on native ground at last. All right. And so uh, he doesn't quite fess up because he, you know, he doesn't fess up, hey, I'm Odysseus. All right. He sort of makes the story of where he comes from to this shepherd boy, not knowing that it's Athena, all right? Uh, because it says in there that that is part of his cunning. You know, he's, he's a duplicitous type he is, all right? Um, let's see. But then she, as Athena, calls him and uh, tells him about everything, fills him in on what's going on. Um, line 341 says, Pallas Athena, daughter of Zeus, who always stands beside you, shields you in every exploit. All right. So she admits who she is and, and reveals herself to him and says, I shield you in every exploit. Because we know that there's so much that he never would have ever been able to accomplish without Athena, even going all the way back to the Iliad. To tell you all the trials is about line, let's say, 346 to tell you all the trials you must suffer in your palace endure them all you must you have no choice and to no one no man no woman not a soul reveal that you are a wanderer home at last don't tell anybody that you're here 
we got to do this the right way. Directly across from that, you know, these lines are directly across on page 297. But she, Penelope, she waits in your halls as always. Her life an endless hardship, wasting away the nights, weeping away the days. All right. So, let's see here. So, Odysseus hides the riches that the Phaeacians have left him with. And Athena says at the bottom of page 298, about line 429, Royal son of Laertes, Odysseus, old campaigner, think how to lay your hands on all those brazen suitors. Lording it over your house now, three whole years, courting your noble wife, offering gifts to win her. But she, forever brokenhearted for your return, builds up each man's hopes, dangling promises, dropping hints to each, but all the while with something else in mind. All right, just as clever as he. All right, skipping to the last two lines of the next section. I would fight 300 men, great goddess, with you to brace me, comrade in arms in battle. So he's going, he says, I will take on all of these suitors and I will gladly do it by myself. Well, not by myself, but I'll take them on knowing that you have my back because you have helped get me here. All right. She says first, okay, and this is important because this harkens back to something that uh, trick he pulled when he was in Troy that Helen was talking about. First is about line, let's say five, uh, 455. First, I will transform you. No one must know you. I will shrivel the supple skin on your lithe limbs, strip the russet curls from your head, and deck you out in rags you'd hate to see some other mortal wear. I'll dim the fire in your eyes so shining once until you seem appalling to all those suitors, even your wife and son you left behind at home. But you, all right, you will make your way to the swine herd first in charge of your pigs, and true to you as always, loyal friend to your son, to Penelope, so self-possessed. You'll find him posted inside, uh, beside his swine, grubbing around by Raven's Rock in the spring called Erethusa, rooted for feeding that make pigs sleek and fat, the nuts they love, the dark pools they drink. Wait there. Sit with him. Ask him all he knows. I'm off to Sparta, where the women are a wonder to call Telemachus home, your own dear son, Odysseus. All right, so what she's going to do is she is going to make him look like an old beggar so that he can maneuver about through um, all of the people that are there on the island and be undetected. So it's almost like he's going to be gathering information so he knows, you know, who's in charge of the suitors, what the suitors have been doing, and get a lay of the whole situation which is exactly the type of thing he did. If you remember what uh, Helen said, she said, you know, proving one of his you know, acts of cunning is he dressed up like a poor beggar and he entered into the city of Troy and he went all about seeking information. She says that, you know, she was keen and she caught on to the fact that, oh, this is Odysseus, asked him all kinds of questions. If you remember this, uh, from earlier. And so here we've got the kind of, you know, the, the bookends of this. Early on, Helen tells us this is how it worked and this is how he was effective. And now we've got the, you know, we're, we're back home again and he's doing the same kind of thing that uh, Athena is helping him out with. So I find that to be an interesting balance going on in this particular story. All right. But it says here, Let's say 486, true enough. Some young lords in a black cutter lurk in ambush, poised to kill the prince, that's Telemachus, before he reaches home. But I have my doubts they will. All right. So we know that uh, the suitors have been planning to ambush Telemachus when he returns. They're waiting to do that. But Athena says, I have my doubts, all right? And if we know that Athena is there helping out, we're probably in pretty good hands, all right? So Odysseus has finally made it home. It's taken him a while. He's dealt with a lot to get there, but he's finally home. But his work is far from over, all right? So 
That is uh, book 13. I want you to read book 14 in the meantime, annotate book 14, come up with your own original thoughts for book 14, and then meet, you here, meet me here, and I will give you mine. All right? So until that time, and as always, I want to wish you happy reading.